Tā kā labrīt cienījumie webināra dalībnieki. Šodienas priecājumies jūs visus redzēt šodienas seminārā, kura oficiālais nosaukums ir publisko iepirkumu iespējas Lietuvā. To organizējam mēs no LIA Eiropas biznesa atbalsta tīkla puses sadarbībā ar iepirkumu akadēmiju. Šis webinārs ir daļa no pakalpojumiem, kurus mēs no LIA puses piedāvājam Latvijas uzņēmumiem saistībā ar publisko iepirkumu iespējām ārpus Latvijas. Daļa jau arī no šodienas webināra dalībniekiem izmanto mūsu piedāvāto pakalpojumu TED Alert Service, jeb tas ir individuāli pielāgotas iepirkuma sistēmas, teiksim, abonēšana, kas nozīmē, ka katru dienu Latvijas uzņēmumu saņem savā ēpastā īpaši viņiem atlasītus tenderus ārpus Latvijas. Mēs no uzņēmuma puses gan arī paši saprotam, ka tas nav viegli, tas ir diezgan sarežģīti, un bieži vien tas arī ir šīs valoda problēmas, un tieši tādēļ mēs plānojam organizēt šādus webinārus konkrēti par valstī, lai saprastu, vai tur ir kādas specifiskākas prasības un kā var būt piedalīties. Šodien šāds webinārs ir veltīts Lietuvai, kādai Lietuvi, jo tā ir, varētu teikt, kaimiņu valsts, arī mēs no savas puses Latvijas uzņēmumiem, tiem, kur vēlas uzsākt savu darbību ārpus Latvijas, piedāvājam, teiksim, sākt varbūt ar kaimiņu valstī. Gan loģistikas dēļ, gan arī varbūt tās prasības vieglāk saprotnams. Šodienas webinārā mēs, mums ir divi lektori no Lietuvas, Žilvīnas Briedis un Paulijus Murauskas, kur jābija pārstāv juridisko biroju Sorainen, kuram ir arī gan biroja, gan Latvijā, Lietuvā un Igaunijā. Abiem lektoriem ir pieredze, desmit gadus ilga pieredze tieši publisko iepirkumu jomā, sākot jau ar pieteikumiem un līdz ar to un beidzot arī ar dažādiem teiksim, juridisko jautājumiem un strīdus jautājumu risināšanu. No loģistikas viedokļa, kā jau minēju, šis webinārs ir ierakstīts. Kopā ar webināru prezentācijām jūs šo ierakstu saņemsiet arī pēc pasākuma. Jautājums jūs variet uzdot čatā, kā arī... Ir būs iespēja arī lektori, jūs arī uzaicinās varbūt šos jautājumus uzdot prezentāciju starpā. Arī tie cilvēki, kuri uzņēma, kur jau bija uzdevuši šos savus jautājumus registrācijas formā, jau es sapatu, ka daļu šo jautājumu ir iestrādāt jau arī prezentācijā. Prezentācija būs sadalīta nosacīts trīs daļās un varētu būt arī neliels pārtraukums starp prezentācijām. Tā kā domāju kad, paldies par uzmanību, novēlījums veiksmīgu webināru. So, dear Žilvinas and Paulius, so now I would like to give the floor to you. I just introduced just short, brief introductory words about the webinar and about your experience, but I suppose that you could provide this information better. So the floor is yours. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Vilnas Biedis, and we're happy to have this webinar with you, and we will um, willing uh, that, uh, that you will find this information uh, useful for, uh, uh, for participating in Lithuanian tenders. So I would like to start uh, this web webinar um, with a statement that it, it is possible for Latvian companies uh, to participate in uh, our national public procurements. And we have um, quite much successful experience for Latvi Latvian companies or Estonian companies participating in our national procurements and also not participating, but also winning uh, the tenders by uh, the lowest price or, or uh, due to other quality criteria of, of, of a bid. Uh, there are a lot of uh, formalities in our national public procurement system, but uh, when you, uh, you get uh, to know those uh, formalities, then it, some of them 
or quite much are standard standard clauses and uh, when you participate for for example in one or two tenders in Lithuania so you get to know that it's, it's quite com commonly uh, in the next procurements also will be so I will I will start uh, this uh, first um, part about general view uh, over overview of our uh, national system and I will share my presentation Yes, and while Zilnas is doing so, hi everyone, my name is Paulus. Just a quick logistic note, we have three sections more or less in 45 minutes. So Zilnas would take the first one, I will do the second. Afterwards, we will offer you to have a short break uh, of five up to 10 minutes, and then we'll, we'll conclude with the third part. So yeah, that's the structure, Zilnas, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is the structure of three parts, and I'm starting with the first one. Our national legal requirement is uh, nothing, nothing unique uh, and not essentially differs from any EU member state because our national regulations, all of them are uh, laid down from the EU directives, and we have quite the same understanding of public procurement procedure the same public procurement principles and so on. We have four types of different laws. The first one and the main one is the law on public procurement. It's uh, apl applicable for the classical sector uh, procurements. So mostly for everyone, if, for each procurement, except for defense security, for ut utility sector or uh, concessions. And uh, we have uh, an English version of our law, which is available uh, in the provided link. Uh, you can press and uh, we will share our presentation after this webinar and you will just find this link uh, and you, you may see all our law. It's uh, with the updates until 26 uh, June 2018, so it's a bit outdated. But uh, the core uh, regulation is not uh, changed uh, till today. And if you would like to get more deep knowledge about our regulation, so you can just uh, view the, the core English version of this law. And it's uh, the commonly applied law for any public procurement procedure. The second law is uh, util applicable for utility sector. So it's uh, for procurements where uh, buyers are acting in uh, water, energy, transport, or postal sectors. So this law is a bit more flexible than classical sector, and it's applied only in uh, specific sectors. But uh, the core of this regulation is also the same as classical sector. And we yes, have- I'm sorry, we can still see the title slide. Maybe you can switch the slides because I guess you're talking about the third one. Yes, you can see now, sliding. No? No, I, I see the title slide. Anita, what about yourself? Do you see the title slide as well? Now? Uh, yes, I, I see the title slide. Yeah, it's... it's... Oh, oh, Paulus, you, can you share? Yeah, I can share. Give me one second. Because... Just one second. There we go. Gilvenas, you, you should have the control, Gilvenas. Mm -hmm. Now you see? Oh, yes. That? Okay, yes. so. Yes. Just to repeat, we have uh, uh, four laws regulating public procurements in our Lithuania. So the first one is classical sector and we have it in English version. Here is the link, the link. We, we can press it and you find it the English version. The second law is for utility sector. It's also from the directives EU. It's uh, applicable uh, when the buyer acts in the water, energy, transport or postal sectors. As I, as I said, it's more uh, flexible. Uh, the third law, it's a bit more specific. When it's about defense and security procurements. We have a third law in, in, in the field of defense and security. 
there are uh, additional requirements uh, to get acquainted with the confidential and classified data in order to, to participate in, su in, su in such tenders. There should be some certificates to get acquainted with the classified, classified, classified data. And the fourth, fourth law is law on concessions. It's not uh, the pure public procurements, but also some kind of public procurement procedures are also applied uh, to the concessions. So both, uh, so each law is based on the EU regulation, and and the, the four do not differ from Latvia or any EU member state. We have uh, in Lithuania, we have uh, three types of procurements classif classified by their monetary value. So according to the budget of a procurement, there are three types. First one is international procurements. Second are simplified procurements and uh, there is low value public procurements. Um, when we are talking about international procurements, uh, I have listed all those uh, thresholds that should be equal or exceed uh, in order the, the procurement to be qualified as international procurement. When the, uh, the procuring authority buys works, uh, so it should be uh, above, equal or exceed 5,350 euros without VAT. If for example, uh, procuring uh, authority buys supplies or services, then it uh, the value is equal or exceeds 139, 214. It depends on what uh, contracting authority buys those supplies and services. And we have a different value for the uh, utilities and defense security sectors. So if it's the defense and security sector or utilities, so the value should be equal or exceed 400, 2000, uh, for, yeah, 400, 2000. 28 uh, without VAT. So it's uh, the international procurements. Uh, the simplified procurements are uh, th those who value is less than international procurements. Uh, and uh, the third procurement type is low value. It's, it's the part of simplified procurements and it's the less, uh, the most less value of, the, of uh, procurements. When we're talking about works contracts, it is, it is a one, 145,000 without VAT. When we are talking about supplies and services contracts in, in any sector, it is a 58,000 euros without VAT. And uh, what is the main difference uh, between those uh, procurements? The simplified procurements and the low value procurements are more flexible procedurally. So contracting authorities, the buyers may not apply certain uh, tender uh, documents, tender requirements, qualification criteria, some standstill period to conclude a, a contract may be not applied and so on. So the simplified procurements are a bit more efficient for a contracting authority to conduct. Still, uh, simplified procurements and international procurements are quite similarly uh, published in our system uh, to the public. So it's not, um, it's not very essential differ, differ as regards the publishment announcement of those public procurements. All our public procurements can be found in one single portal. It is uh, called the Central Public Procurement Information System. And we provided you a, a link to our national procurement information system. This system is not very user friendly in English language, but still there are quite much tabs which are available in, in English language. And uh, when using this system, you may find uh, the new tenders, the existing tenders, the planned tenders, or other type of notices, which uh, might be interest for you. And uh, the, the use of this uh, system, national IT system is mandatory for all contracting authorities, 
if in international simplified pro procurements, uh, there are only some rare exceptional cases when the tender may be not announced publicly or may be not conducted via our information system. So most of them will be found in the same portal in, the, in one link which we provided to you. Uh, as regards international procurements, they are also uh, published in the TED, Tenders Electronic Daily, it's EU uh, administered website. So it's more user friendly in English uh, for, for foreign com companies. And if you're willing to find some data about international procurement with the biggest value, so you should uh, take a look. You can look at uh, Tenders Electronic Daily. It would be more um, useful, uh, maybe, maybe more user friendly to understand what is procured, what is the value, and what is required from the bidder uh, to participate. Here is a, an example of our system, of our national system. As you can see, the tabs are quite uh, uh, prepared in English language. On the left side, uh, we see all the new tenders which are announced currently. And uh, it already indicates what is uh, procured. For example, uh, the first one is about refrigerating equipment uh, by Lithuanian forces. And uh, the other is about uh, camera, uh, camera annexes, attachments, and so on. Uh, on the right side in the middle you see the deadline deadline to provide a bid uh, so it's a very important uh, information until when you can apply and submit your interest to, to participate in procurement and uh, it also indicates when the the procurement was published so we can see that uh, the these three procurements were uh, published ye yesterday and uh, on the right side, we see uh, filters. And these filters are quite uh, useful. You can filter uh, procurements by their type. You can choose just to look for international procurements with the biggest value. You can just look for simplified procurements. Or you can just look for low value procurements. Uh, also, you can uh, filter by any uh, other uh, filters. So it's quite useful uh, to search and to classify the uh, out outstanding uh, published procurements. And uh, it's uh, also in this system, there is a, a help uh, to get an, uh, for foreign entities to understand which procurement is international, which is, which is simplified or which is low value. There is uh, the flagging next to each procurement and when we see, for example, EU flag, it means that this procurement is international, and we just we need just to identify whether it is uh, what kind of goods, services, or works uh, it is procured. So we we know at least that this could be the minimum value or budget of a procurement, with some exception exceptions, but it's quite rough rough in indication what kind of budget could be. Uh, here, when we see our national Lithuanian flag, it means that it is a simplified procurement, so it will it will not exceed the, uh, the international thresholds, and the, you already also indicates that it's it's rough rough maximum budget for the procurement. And the, the last one is a uh, low value procurements. It's our national flag with a, a letter M. It's a, minimal, minimal, major, yeah, low value tender. So it, it helps, this flagging helps you to understand quickly what, uh, what procurement importance by their value it is announced. We have also a, a different type of announcement of upcoming procurements in our system. Uh, each contracting authority, CA, should prepare its annual plan, what uh, the contracting authority is planning to buy uh, within whole upcoming year. 
and these plans should be uh, published until uh, 15 March of ongoing year. So when when you I, I provided here a link where you can see all the plans from each contracting authority, um, and uh, they they plans for all upcoming year. Uh, so it is a useful uh, instrument to understand what to expect from the upcoming year. Still, uh, the contracting authorities may amend those uh, annual plans on the ongoing year and to add something or to remove something from their plans. So this uh, annual plans is just a preliminary indication what could be procured and what to expect. But still, it, it's uh, not so st st static uh, me measure and it could be um, amended during the year. Here is an example from uh, the link. You can see uh, the procurement ob object, what, what is going to be procured and when to expect for such a procurement object. Uh, it is showed in the line anticipated date of procurement beginning. So it, it shows the quarter, when to expect, for example, the first quarter of the year, the second quarter of the year, or uh, the last quarter of the year. And you can, for example, if you are, uh, know what kind of uh, uh, procuring authority you are interested, so you can look on that specific procuring authority. For example, the biggest ones, uh, Lithuanian Energy or other customers, so you can already understand what to expect from the legal market from upcoming years, uh, from public market. And also we have uh, uh, prior consultations with the market participants. So it's also not the exact public procurement, but contracting authorities may consult with the market, with the tenderers, with the potential bidders about the upcoming procurement. They can do it in several ways. They can provide a technical, preliminary technical specification. So the the preliminary features of, of the procure, procured object, for example, technical data, what uh, the procuring authorities expect to buy and wait for the remarks. And the second option is just to launch a other type of market consultation, uh, for example, questionnaires to potential bidders and ask, ask them how the procurement should be conducted uh, what to expect, how the award criteria, how to select the best bid uh, and ask for any data which, which is uh, relevant for a bid, uh, for a customer, for a buyer. And uh, you can find all those market consultations also in the same link of our data, uh, Central Public Procurement Information System. And when uh, it's also, useful flagging to understand quickly what what is it announced so when it comes to letter t it means it's a, a preliminary technical specification and it's not yet the exact public procurement it's just a consultation on preliminary preliminary conditions and uh, the attenders may just provide their remarks uh, whether should be this amended or not when it comes to MC, so it's market consultation. So you also there could be a questionnaire or maybe some meetings with a contracting authority to decide how uh, contracting authority should buy certain goods, works, or services. Um, and uh, it is not mandatory to participate in those consultations uh, for a potential bidder. Even if you missed those consultations, you can still apply uh, uh, and uh, participate in the exact public procurement when it will be announced. Uh, but it's useful to participate in those consultations because you get a knowledge about the uh, needs of a potential buyer. And uh, there could be a constructive dialogue with the buyer, what should be taken into account or not and not. But it's not mandatory. And uh, so it's one, I, I just talked of one way how to, to 
find the public procurements, but there are alternative, alternative options how to track our national public procurements. And it's more, much easier. You can use CVP codes. Uh, it's a, a single classification system for public procurements of certain goods. For example, if you, it is a construction works of certain uh, buildings, so such, such uh, procurement object has its CVP code. If, if someone is willing to buy cars, also this uh, procurement object type of procurement also has its specific CVP code. And these CVP codes are standard, uh, st standard uh, within all EU. And I also provided the link where you can find each CVP code. And what you can do, you can just enter our national public procurement uh, system and uh, take uh, su subscribe to RRS feed by those CVP codes. Uh, here's a link how to do it. And uh, the outcome is such that you just open your Google Chrome, Firefox, or uh, Mozilla, whatever, and you have some kind a, a tab next uh, to your browser where uh, the browser uh, filters all our national public procurements by their CVP codes. And each day you may find a new notice that the procurements were announced of that CVP code. So you already uh, have an automated uh, filtering of relevant procurements and it's, it's more easier to find which procurement is more interesting to you. And it's uh, very, very easy to do, but it's, it's quite technical. So I just uh, indicated a link how to do it. Uh, it's in, in English language, how to do it. And it's a more easier uh, way to find a public procurement than searching from our national public procurement system itself. Uh, just also to point one practical point, uh, sometimes procuring authorities do not insert the correct CVP code when announcing a public procurement. So filtering by CVP codes could miss some important procurement if a contracting authority will uh, insert a uh, not correct CVP code, but uh, roughly it's uh, and commonly the CVP codes are correct and it's a, a, a way of tracking the, the national public procurements. Also, there are private business uh, acting in Lithuania who suggest uh, for companies to track all the national procurements and the, the, they suggest not only searching by CVP codes, but also by some kind of keywords. You can insert what kind of keywords will be interested, uh, interested and the IT system will search for you. For example, you already may insert construction, uh, medical device or something, and it, it will filter all the data and will provide all the data into email each day. And uh, these uh, services are not uh, highly priced. At least uh, this uh, attenders, uh, attenders uh, services uh, around 140 euros without VAT per year. So you can just uh, order such kind of services uh, for 150 something euros without VAT per year and you will find all relevant public procurement uh, procurements of Lithuania in your email each day. So it's a more easier way to, to track those uh, national procurements. And uh, now I would like to, to point out where to find the exact uh, procurement documents in our national procurement system. Uh, there are four steps to enter. Uh, uh, and we, then we can find all the conditions how to participate, uh, what are the award criteria, what are the contract conditions, and so on. So when the announced the, the tender no notice is announced in our public procurement system, then you need at first to press the procurement object. It's now uh, the procured speeding uh, equipment. 
So when you press the active link uh, uh, indicated as number one, then a new window will pop up and you can view those uh, public procurement documents in two options. You can register uh, your account in our national public procurement system, or you can view the document without reg registration. And um, commonly, each bidder may, potential bidder may view the procurement documents without any registration in our national system. So we, you just need to press the view external documents button indicated as number two. My colleague Paulus will uh, talk about the registration a bit later. So when you press this uh, view external documents, a new window will also pop up and then you will find documents, documents uh, link. And you should press documents and here the, it is all those documents uh, it's a, a standard uh, window for every procurement and you will find uh, contract conditions con conditions for the participation qualification criteria everything mo mo in most uh, ways those documents are prepared in uh, pdf or uh, doc uh, word word format and you can um, take a look at all the conditions which needs to be met to participate in this procurement. And uh, about the language of procurement documents, um, at least in our uh, law, it is required that the procurement documents should be drafted in Lithuania language, in our national language, but the contracting authority may it's, it's, it's its discretion to draft the documents in different other languages as well. So uh, the potential bidder, when uh, uh, opens the documents, may ask may ask uh, uh, the, uh, the procuring authority to provide a copy of translated documents, but it's up to the contracting authority to give it or not uh, to give it. What we see from our practice is that uh, the procurement documents most commonly are drafted in national language and no other languages are available. But uh, when the procurement is more uh, of a biggest value or the project is itself is, has a significant importance, then there are like uh, English version and the Lithuanian version. And the contracting authorities uh, translate themselves uh, these documents when the, the projects are more important. But what we see from the practice is that even EU member states who uh, members who participate in our procurements, they translate those procurement documents themselves with the support of translator or have a local partner contact in Lithuania for a support. So even uh, the tender documents were announced in our national language. Uh, we see that the tenderers uh, find, the, find the ways how to proceed further and to participate in procurements. In procurement. But I uh, also would like to point one uh, issue that the contracting, if the procurement documents are uh, in Lithuanian language, it does not mean that the bid itself should be presented in Lithuanian language as well the contracting authorities may accept uh, the bid in English language. Uh, and uh, usually in practice, uh, contracting authorities accept uh, the bids in English language, at least the part, the technical data uh, about the suggested goods, about suggested works or suggested services. If you need to provide some kind of brochures, uh, some kind of user manual documents, so this part of documents might be accepted by the contracting authority in, in English language, and there will be no need for a translation, but it's up to also to contracting authority, but the contracting authority usually accepts such uh, at least part of documents in foreign language. Uh, we have uh, different types of procurement structuring but most common procurement structures are only two. 
So it's open tender or negotiation negotiation procedure. We have a lot. Uh, we have a lot of others like uh, restricted procedure, competitive dialogue, uh, and so and others as well. But uh, statistics shows and our practice shows that these two are the main ones, and and uh, most of the budgeting uh, goes through those uh, open tender or negotiated procedures. And just to understand the roughly how those procedures uh, are being organized. I will say that open tender starts from the announcement of procurement documents. So you will find all the documents uh, in our one data system. And uh, the bidder needs to place only one bid uh, to the contracting authority via our uh, information system. This bid should include everything about uh, technical data about the uh, technical features of suggested product, uh, technical features of uh, suggested works uh, and so on. And also the pricing, all, all pricing and technical data should be in the same one bid at, at, at the same day. When the deadline comes, you need just to provide one bid. And after that, the contracting authority ev evaluates the, the bids, the submitted bids and uh, decides which is the winner, depending on, on the price or quality criteria, uh, which were established in public procurement documents. So it's quite, it's quite straightforward procedures with, with, with some exemptions, but it's very easy and understandable procedure, open tent, and it's quite common. The second one is negotiated procedure. It's a bit different, but uh, it's also very popular in Lithuania, and it's uh, this procedure allows uh, for a bidder and contracting authority to negotiate uh, during the tender procedure. The open tender does not allow any negotiations. So uh, negotiation procedure starts also with the announcement of procurement documents. Then uh, the potential bidder needs to provide only an application. It's no which just shows the interest to participate in the uh, negotiated procedure and the bidder does not need to indicate any price does not need to indicate any technical data just to provide the data who will bid and maybe the team members who will uh, together bid with the, the with the tenderer after that uh, the con uh, the contracting authority request to provide at least initially bid and to include uh, the technical and pricing data for negotiations. And when the uh, initial bid is placed by the tenderer, the negotiated proce negotiations procedure st starts. And uh, it depends on the contracting authority and willingness to, to negotiate on certain conditions, but contracting authority may negotiate on mostly every aspect of procurement. So about the price, technical aspects of a procured object, features of what should be taken into account, what, what, what is not. Uh, also, there could be negotiations about contract conditions, about execution terms, deadlines to provide services, to provide works, the quality of uh, works and so on. And uh, these negotiations take place uh, in live meetings. It could be in live meetings, could be uh, very formal in a central public procurement information system. Sometimes negotiations just uh, mm, means that the uh, contracting authority asks for lowering the price, the initial price. But uh, there are a lot of negotiations when the, they are mm, take a live meeting and a, a lot of uh, amendments are being made to the initially announced public procurement documents. And when uh, the negotiation negotiations end, the contracting authority re-announce the tender documents on the negotiated conditions and um, asks for each tenderer to provide a final bid. And when the final bid uh, takes place with all the final technical data and pricing, then the evaluation uh, is uh, is being performed and the winning bid is selected. And uh, those are the, the popular procurement procedures in Lithuania. And it's just those um, 
procedures could vary a bit, but it's a rough understanding how those procedures are, are um, working in Lithuania. And uh, when you open the public procurement documents, uh, you should uh, take the most attention to certain, certain conditions, what are listed there. So in each public procurement document, document you will find exclusion criteria and minimum qualification requirement. Uh, sometimes contracting authorities may not apply those exclusion criteria and minimum qualification requirements, but it's uh, uh, in exceptional cases. And uh, it means uh, exclusion criteria are related to the absence of conviction of criminal liability, duly payment of social uh, payments, no infringement of uh, competition law or related cri criteria. And the minimum qualification requirements are related to the professional uh, knowledge uh, of a tenderer, previous knowledge within three years, within five years before the bid. Uh, so the contracting authority may ask to have some kind of specialist in your team. Uh, to meet the minimum qualification requirements. And uh, there are financial requirements, for example, for a turnover, for a liquidity ratio or other requirements, which could be foreseen. And if you uh, do not meet the exclusion criteria or minimum qualification requirements, it is a straightforward dismissal of your bid. So, um, when you open the public procurement document, it is important to, to take a look at those conditions and if your company satisfies those conditions. Uh, and the most important uh, um, document part is technical specification. It's a, an annex to each public procurement document where all those uh, requirements related to the procured object is listed. There are, uh, those technical specifications usually are the main document uh, uh, what the procurement uh, contracting authority is willing to buy. And uh, these technical specifications uh, usually are quite big in their amount of pages. There are a lot of requirements uh, uh, for uh, quality of services, works or goods, uh, how, what standards should be met those products and so on. So the, this technical specification should be read very carefully, carefully, carefully. And we see from practice that it's the most common uh, bid rejection uh, due to not compliance with that technical specification. Usually the tenderers uh, fail to comply fully with a technical specification. And it could be a, a quite, uh, strong argument to dismiss the bid. So if you're willing to participate and you find that the documents in Lithuania language, so my recommendation is to find, the, at the first, to find the technical specification and to have it translated and, and to read whether your company meets the technical specification and later on proceed to other procurement documents because it's the main document for a procured object. Uh, also, uh, the procuring authority has to announce the main contract conditions or all or the draft of procurement contract. Usually the contracting authority provides all uh, contract conditions and a draft procurement contract. So uh, when you're deciding to place a bid or not, you already uh, foresee what contractual conditions, obligations will be uh, for you during the execution of a contract. And you may accept those conditions or not. You may challenge and dispute those conditions. And you should read those documents very carefully because uh, it could lead to termination of a contract due, due to essential infringements uh, and other high risks for a tenderer if the tenderer will not comply with the procurement contract during its execution. Uh, each procurement document also contains award criteria. So procuring authorities should indicate on what grounds uh, the winning bid is selected, whether only on price 
or uh, on price and quality criteria. Mm -hmm. So usually in Lithuania, the price is still dominating criteria, lowest price criteria, but, but uh, there is also quite much tenders with the price plus quality criteria and uh, the contracting authorities then select uh, the most advantageous uh, tender based on the price and quality criteria uh, overall. The, you should also take into account uh, the data about procurement budget and bid pricing conditions. Uh, as regards procurement budget, con contracting authorities are not obliged to disclose procurement budget in their public procurement documents. So you may not find any data, what is the, the planned amount to, to spend on this certain procurement. Mm, but uh, sometimes this procurement budget is indicated and disclosed to every potential bidder. And you may find it in the exact public procurement documents. And if you bidding ab above this, uh, this budget, it means, uh, uh, high risk to, that the, this bid will be dismissed uh, as not uh, acceptable to the, the contracting authority. And uh, you should also take a, a very a big attention to the pricing options. Um, there are a lot of different pricing models applied in Lithuania uh, and the contracting authority sometimes request only a fixed sum, which includes all services, uh, works, and so on, or sometimes a fixed uh, fee for a certain type of unit. So um, you should re read carefully those pricing conditions in tender documents and to, to consider whether those pricing elements are uh, relevant and, and acceptable to you. And uh, the last part is procedural part of procurement. Uh, the procedural part of procurement is quite uh, repeatedly uh, the same. So if you, for, for example, will try to participate in open tender, you will get a knowledge how this uh, procedural part goes in each open tender, uh, wh whether it will be another procuring authority and so on. And then you will get the basic understanding of procedural part when you participate at least in one or two open tenders or, or in the negotiated procedures. And um, what should what I would like to talk what uh, the tenderer should do uh, when the tender is announced uh, and uh, what the tenderer has rights. So the tenderer may request the contracting authority to amend or to clarify the procurement documents. For, uh, if procurement documents are not clear, so contracting uh, so tenderer may file via our national IT system, a request to clarify or to amend the already announced uh, contract uh, conditions. And the tenderer may request to clarify or amend anything, for example, uh, as regards qualification requirements, uh, exclusion grounds, award criteria, contract conditions, whatever. And the tenderer may requ request to do it within the deadline, which is foreseen in the exact public procurement document. But usually th this deadline is uh, six up from six to nine calendar days before expiration of bid submission deadline. So you, you, sh you should uh, see when the deadline is to submit the bid and count backwards nine or six days uh, before this deadline. And it means that this is the term for you to ask uh, for clarifications and amendments. And this uh, way of communicating with the procurement is very, very usual in our practice. Tenders provide uh, quite a, a lot of requests to clarify or amend procurement documents. And it's a polite way to communicate with a potential buyer. The other uh, communication method is a, a bit uh, aggressive. Uh, and it's is just... Uh, to be used if you're willing to go to a court and uh, uh, would like to, to, to amend uh, the existing tender conditions via court procedures, pro procedure. So the tenderer may dispute uh, the already announced procurement documents 
and uh, ex uh, rather than providing a request to amend or clarify documents, the tenderer may provide a pre-trial claim directly to the contracting authority and ask for her uh, for, for, for contacting authority to uh, amend or annual certain unlawful conditions. And it's a it's a mandatory requirement to provide a pre-trial claim if a tenderer considers afterwards to go to a court and challenge the unlawful condition. Uh, and the deadlines are very tough. Uh, when it comes to international procurements, it's 10 calendar days from the announcement of procurement. So uh, if the tenderer uh, sees uh, that the tender was announced uh, on the 1st of January, so it has only two, 20, 10 days to, to challenge those with the submitting a pre-trial claim to contracting authority. When it comes to simplified and low value procurements, it is five business days uh, to provide such claim. There are some exemption, uh, exceptions of counting those deadlines, but it's just rough understanding uh, how to dispute those uh, tender conditions. As I aware, the Latvia has a different uh, disputing practice in, uh, in public procurements and Latvian company should file the claims directly to public procurement bureau, and we and this is the, the biggest difference in disputes uh, in Lithuania, because we are filing all the claims directly to the buyer itself, and the buyer itself uh, has the right and the discretion to satisfy or not satisfy the claim, and um, um, the practice shows that uh, usually the buyers are not willing to satisfy the claims and uh, they're willing to leave their initial opinion and decisions. And we have a lot of, a, a lot of, um, a huge uh, amount of cases, court cases where the tenderers seek to change tender conditions or other decisions of contracting the authorities via court proce proceedings. And it's a, a huge amount of court uh, yeah, proceedings. And as, as I aware, Latvia does not have such a, such, such kind of uh, amount of disputes. And uh, just to uh, understand what, what are the fees to challenge uh, those uh, conditions or any other decision of a contracting authority. So when it comes to low value procurements, it's quite not much to 225 and to, to 263. But when it comes to other uh, procurement uh, values, so it's quite big values. And uh, when we are talking about international procurements, the court fee itself, the court fee just to, to, to submit and accept the claim, it's uh, from 2000 to 3,750. Uh, uh, it depends uh, on when you're providing a claim. Uh, uh, or before the award decision or after award decision. If you provide the, the claim after the bidding queue is established and the award decision is adopted, so it is the biggest amount of uh, court fee. So it's only the, the court fee. Yeah. Um, we have a national bo body uh, state body public procurement of office, which provides uh, uh, in its uh, website useful link for any potential bidder, provides market knowledge about each public procurement, about uh, each public procurement topic. Public procurement office may also provide answers to the questions of potential bidders via email or the direct link in the public procurement office. As well, the, pub, uh, the public procurement office provides useful statistical data on relevant public procurement topics. Here I provided a link where you can find the uh, analytical data about uh, procurements in Lithuania, statistical data, uh, values, and so on. And one is, uh, tool is very useful. You can um, find the, the data about every contract concluded uh, 
and public procurement contract within uh, the period from 2015 until uh, today. Until today, here I provided a link. This tool allows you to filter the data by each tenderer, so you can look uh, see a contracting authority or procurement objects or CVP codes. It means that if you enter this link, you can filter any data and search uh, a data about competitors. What uh, competitor contracts won? What are the contract prices? Uh, how the competitor uh, succeeding uh, in one uh, contracting authority tenders, how the competitor succeeds in other contracting authorities uh, tenders and so on. And it's a, a very useful statistical data to get knowledge about uh, our national market and who who buys most, who succeeds most, uh, and the value of each uh, procurement contract. Yes, and this is, uh, I have finished my part and I would like to, to take part to uh, follow yeah, to proceed. Thank you, thank you, Jelenas. Uh, I still see that we have some questions. Should we run yeah. through those? Yes, I just wanted to say that maybe we can have a look at the question. Yeah. yeah. Do you see them or you would like that we read it? It's in English. No, we can we can look through them themselves. Uh, the first one was wait. Maybe I can read it and then yes, we'll see yes, answers. and you you can see whether you will provide the answer now or it's yeah. within your presentation. So Okay, so the first one was regarding negotiation procedures. In the negotiation procedure type of public procurements, can the procurement authority on, at its own discretion, for example, they like the initial bid offer prices and decide at the same time and resources not to conduct the negotiation round, decide not to conduct the negotiation round after the initial bid. In other words, the initial bid will become also the final bid. Uh no, uh, it, it depends on the uh, no. So procurement documents foresee the procedure as submission the initial bid and later on the final bid. Uh, but uh, sometimes procurement documents also says that uh, if uh, the tenderer will not place a final bid, then. Uh, the initial bid will be considered as final. So uh, if the procurement documents indicate such clause, so yes, then the initial bid could become as final. So it's only, only one way when the initial bid could be final, but uh, in most cases, it should not be uh, the final bid. No, yeah, no, no. The the procure, procurement authority cannot decide to save time. It it either decides to go ahead through the whole procurement or to cancel it and start all over again. So just just to reiterate. Okay, the second question is why is that the, the Lithuanian in Lithuania the procurement authority, for example, LAKD, that's the Lithuanian Road Authority or Lithuanian Rail Services, LTG, one of the companies, other do not publicly announce or at least to tender participants, participant names who submitted the bids and prices which were submitted. In contrary, in public procurements in Estonia and Latvia, this information is usually announced within minutes from the other submission time. Similar practice as it is in Estonia and Latvia has been observed also in other countries. Uh, yeah, we, it's a, a standard understanding in Lithuania and uh, comes from our national law that uh, the participants and the pricing is uh, published only when the award decision is adopted. And uh, uh, the contracting authorities do not establish, uh, do, do not announce this data uh, earlier bec because of, of a risk, maybe of a competition risk, maybe someone will, uh, will not participate further, uh, maybe some kind of agreements will, within competitors could be so to avoid some, some kind of risks. Uh, they are not publishing this data uh, within the minutes after the bid is placed. 
and uh, this the, this information is just uh, published later on uh, when the award decision is adopted and uh, and after the procurement uh, is conducted and uh, the procurement contract signed so there is statistical um, forms which are public publicly announced and uh, there is all the participates uh, participants named in those uh, statistical forms and you can find those in our data system in each procurement who participated and uh, on what conditions they participated but yes we do not announce it uh, two minutes a uh, few minutes after submission yeah, and just to add the, yes. the additional result of this that, for example, in the negotiation negotiation procedure, the suppliers may not, the bidders may not meet one another during the negotiation. We know examples from other countries where maybe even joint negotiations can be made. So this is not the case in Lithuania. And as Gilman has explained, we, we keep the names, titles confidential until the the results are announced. Right. So we had two questions. Both of them are done. But yeah, but we have we answered, or maybe you will need some clarification on those. Sure. Yeah. If anyone has any follow-up questions, just unmute or drop down an additional question. Okay, yes, I suppose that yes, if there will be some kind of comments or additional, of course, as a participant can, can still ask. So, so you can go on. <laughs> right. Right, so now we'll move to the second part of, uh, of our presentation, the seminar. Give, give me just a second to see, to find the slides. There we are. So the second part, uh, covers mostly registration and participation procedure. At points, uh, this might be also a bit, I don't know, too, too formal, too nitty gritty, but we just thought it would be, uh, well, very beneficial for, for yourselves as, as foreign uh, subjects to know what is the procedure, the very initial steps that uh, you need to take in order to actually place a bid. Jilvan has uh, did a really good job in explaining the, the, the surrounding uh, material around it, right? And as he mentioned, you can even check the tender documents without really registering yourself as, as a bidder in Lithuania. So that, that allows you for flexibility, right? Because even before even taking any actions, you, you, can, you can really measure yourself whether you're interested in, the, in a particular Tender. But if you decide to go ahead, then all the questions relating to the registration and participation arise. By if we would be talking in the same measures as, as Gilvin has spoke about the valuing, we should uh, take into account the first, the very first step that the very uh, lowest value procurements, meaning anything under 3000 euros, maybe even done without any prior announcement, uh, either through the system or, or on the website or by email, it can be done even verbally and without even any written contract. So in practice, this would probably mean that if you're a very specialized supplier and there's a, 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 a contracting authority that wants your goods or services, it just calls you up and you settle what would be the deal and only an invoice then could follow up. Even a contract is not needed. The second threshold going from the lowest upwards would be uh, the low value procurements up to 10,000 uh, 10, euros without VAT. This also allows for uh, wide range of flexibility from the contracting authority side uh, because it can without grounding any reasons or 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 grounds it can choose a single bidder approach it by by any means necessary by phone email in person and uh, conclude a contract 
Uh, so this this uh, this provides for certain certain flexibility. There are some some rules attached to it. For example, a contracting authority may not uh, may not embark on multiple procurements during one calendar year of this sort. Meaning it cannot uh, chop uh, 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 a simplified procurement of five fifty thousand euros into 10,000 and then artificially assign multiple contracts. But if the need is there and the actual need is under 10,000 euros, it can approach a single single bidder. So if that is uh, something that is, well, needed for yourself, then probably taking part in the market consultations and, and quizzes that Gilman has spoke about could be beneficial for you because in this way, uh, the contracting authorities in Lithuania will know that that a company such as yourself exists, that these goods are up for, for purchase, and there are options that they could approach you directly, legally, without breaching any, any rules or regulations. Uh, yeah, just uh, as, a, as a general rule, anything more or less above above the low 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 po low value public procurements have to go through the system so the central procurement platform and uh, this is very important because at the, at this stage no no other well communication virtually can take place because if the announcement of the tender takes place within the the system then everything else has to happen through the system as well. Um, the low, the minimum uh, term for for submissions of low value public procurements is three three working days, business days. The contracting authority could could choose to extend it or even initially foresee a, pro, a longer time, but that is that is the term established by by law so yeah so this is uh, everything for low value procurements and anything above that meaning simplified and international procurements are always announced through the system the minimum term for submission varies uh, starting depending on, on 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 the value on the announcement type whether it's electronic or or otherwise it varies from eight business days to 30 calendar days and, and can be extended. So we, we it's, it's not really useful to go into terms here, but either way, the term is established within the, the, the procurement documents. But this is the general picture of how you can, you can expect the contracting authority to act through which means to approach you uh depending on on the value and and the budget they they have at hand right growing forward to the formal nitty-gritty bits the registration takes place within the same platform that children has uh, presented briefly um again it is not very user-friendly uh, I would probably say in both languages, Lithuanian and English. Uh, but then again, currently, uh, the public procurement office in Lithuania is is in the making of an, a new renowned system. So the title could could be changed. Don't be surprised if you would notice a different different uh, viewing of the platform itself, but the essence will remain the same. So what you would need to do, you would need to complete the registration form, first and foremost. You have to initiate and trigger uh, the, 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 the option to make an active, to create an active user within the system. So um, the steps themselves uh, are, we won't go through every and each step of those because that would be too burdensome. Those uh, can be found in the links provided on the screen, but we will touch upon the main issues that probably would either way arise uh, for yourself. So if you would enter the credentials, you would then wait for 
a confirmation. And this is very important. So please note, after you register yourself, the public procurement, procurement office has to confirm your application, so to speak, to activate the user, which uh, could formally take up to three work days, business days. And this is very important if you are seeking to take part in a particular procurement already, right? Because if you have a deadline that is approaching, the decision to, to create an account a few days beforehand could lead to you missing the deadline. So this is why we would suggest that if you have at least a faintest interest in, in taking part in Lithuanian procurements, it's best just to create the user now and have it confirmed beforehand. And if a particular tender arises, you won't have the risk uh, on your hand of being late for the submission date just because the procurement office uh, does not activate your account, so to speak, or asks for additional confirmations or, or, or documents proving that maybe you are the true owner or the representative of the company. So please, please have this uh, in mind. Either way, if when, when registering your account, you will have to create credentials, of course, right? And, uh, and indicate the, the email that is, well, for, for, for this purposes, the, the main source of communication, you will receive uh, all the information through that email. And that person holding that email will, in, in, in the most simple sense of the word, will become the administrator of the account, which, uh, which might become burdensome, right? Because if it's, well, for some companies, it might make sense. For most companies, probably multiple people are involved in, in well, deciding which tenders to to take place in how to formulate the bid, gather the documents and formally place a bid. So therefore the platform allows to, to basically add additional people, additional persons that are in charge. So as I mentioned, the, the registration, uh, the subject that is initiated, uh, indicated in the registration form becomes the administrator, but then you can use add additional uh, users and uh, by doing so, well, expand your human resources that are involved in, in, in placing the bid. So this is the initial form that you will see when registering, registering your, your account. And uh, so this will be the initial point, the initial person point within the company. And once the uh, form is activated, you can approach, you can log in of course, right? And you can choose to add additional profiles, user profiles you can see, you click on it, and then you create additional users. This is uh, also important uh, regarding the signing options. We'll talk a bit about it later, but if you decide to create an additional user or multiple users for that purpose, right? You also can grant the rights to sign the proposal or any documents along, along uh, the proposal, the, the proposal, the complexity of proposal documents. So this is the option that you have to, to choose within, within the window that pops up for the additional purpose, right? Because otherwise the assigning of such an additional person could serve only, well, only limited purposes as the person can probably, well, review and, and see the tenders that are upcoming, give you notice, but either way, the, 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 the initial contact person will only, only that person will be in charge of actually submitting the proposal, which from our experience, again, during the last uh, days and hours, 
before the deadlines uh, becomes well a practical issue that sometimes even even creates actual negative results. So as I mentioned, uh, regarding the signatures, so the proposal can be signed, of course, by just simple hand, handwritten signature, but electronic signatures are also uh, accepted uh, here in Lithuania. But please note that there are a few moments that you have to take into account. So if you would like to sign the proposal through the portal, um, certain browser, browser compatibility uh, measures, IT uh, measures, plugins are, are required. So here you just have to follow the link again and see whether your browser, your computer matches, matches the requirements or you need to install anything, anything on top. And also uh, the providers are also important. Um, we have a, a, a link, a European wide link that actually provides the lists of providers that are well considered compatible for electronic signature. Uh, up, uh, we checked the information yesterday. So in, in Latvia, there's a single trusted provider. provider. And um, so, yeah, if, if your electronic signature is, 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 is uh, based and created by this provider, the, the Latvian State Radio and Television Center, then most likely you're, 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 good, to, you're good to go. Right, um, as I said, the process itself is a bit more lengthier, but some portions of it are, well, uh, very simple and, and standard, whereas others might be, might be, well, pretty nuanced. So the Lithuanian Public Procurement Office has a section for, for such issues, and you can see several step-by-step -step guides that can help you along the way. If uh, anything next to that, arises uh, on your on your table so to speak if you have any questions regarding well both the registration form or or even you have any questions regarding the tendering documents the legal interpretation of center of certain of certain requirements maybe even the proportionality uh, you can always use uh, a public uh, platform also established by our public procurement office. And it, it basically acts as a Q&A format between, between yourself and, and, and the specialists within the public procurement office. So you can literally use the link, type down a question. If you're referring to a particular end, uh, tender, add the credentials. And well, normally within several business days, you, you should get an answer. And, uh, and yeah, at least uh, to that extent, you will have, you have some clarity. It's unlikely that the public procurement office will, will give you a defining verdict and announce a particular tender condition, a lawful or, or anything like that, but you will still get some guidance. And for example, if you're deciding whether to place a claim or not, it could nudge you in, 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 in the right direction. And for very urgent cases, um, maybe the most common is the platform itself is down or acting weirdly for the deadline and you're struggling to to place a proposal, right? And you see that the hours are ticking, the minutes are ticking. You, there's uh, this additional email address that you should you should write down and and please and note the issues at hand, uh, especially if if there are uh, some issues with the platform. Sometimes the platform has well in advance planned maintenance uh, cutouts. I've noticed today there's one. So please take a look, uh, uh, take a look out for those. 
But if you see that the system is down, just write down to that email, add any additional proof. And because in that case, most likely you will have the issue at hand later after, after the term is, is, is done to prove whether the, the platform was really, well, for experiencing any, any problems or, or the issues were at, at, your, at your hand. Um, regarding the very simple steps of registration, I think that's it. I still have some portion of very things to note, but I still see a few. But uh, few I will add the same. Yeah, I will add something uh, to, sure. to Paul's presentation. So this email, uh, which you see in the presentation, the last. Uh, it's pagalba at vpt point lt, so support at the vpt lt. So what we see from practice, uh, the foreign companies write to this email and ask for support, and they are asking in English language. Uh, the public procurement office is not obliged to answer uh, in the foreign language, but uh, the public procurement office shows quite active cooperation and uh, reacts to uh, technical support in English language and even sometimes on the merits uh, consult in English language. So if you just really face technical difficulties, you can uh, write it in English and you may expect uh, the support. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jovenus. <laughs> right, I looked through the chat. So these are uh, more side notes rather than questions. Um, right, and moving forward, if you have your registration steps in place, everything's done, you have your account activated, then you can using again, the, the, the slides that uh, we showed during the first part, mark your interest in a particular tender. And here on out, uh, we would like to draw a few a few things that must be noted that could also assist you greatly in pricing a bid successfully. So as I said, if, if the procurement is announced through the platform, right? Only meaning apart from low value or, or verbal contracts, everything needs to go through the system meaning that if you have a question, you have to pose it through the system. If you would like uh, to ask for an extension of the deadline for proposal submission, it goes through the, through the system. Uh, if you have a pre-trial claim, again, right? It also goes through the system, um, which means that in practice, still, the tender does include uh, an email, a name and surname, the telephone of a contact person, of uh, the person in charge from the contracting authority staff. Uh, in practice, of course, you, 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 you may still call them up and ask them questions, but uh, anything apart from, I don't know, procedural or, or assistant wise questions should be follow up followed up by, by a written consultation, right? So if you have an, a question regarding a tender condition that you inquired on by phone, so the, note the, the, the respective staff member as well that we will ask it in writing because we also have uh, a few cases on our hands now where without doing so, uh, the courts are reluctant to believe that the contracting authority will made any consultations by phone that would contradict the conditions, meaning that anything that, that the conditions or written uh, questions and answers, of course, gain priority to anything that, that goes between the parties verbally. So that sort of goes without saying, but uh, please uh, yeah, keep in mind that even uh, emails should be used well only for limited purposes and in in case of a dispute could could have limited uh, limited evidential value right next to it the submission date 
Uh, once you see a tender, uh, of course, first take a look whether you're interested at it. And then please note the exact submission date that is indicated as, well, initially it will be indicated as the final deadline, but in all cases, uh, whether, whether from stemming from the questions or proposals from the suppliers or on its own initiative, the contracting authority may extend the term. So, so please note that, but then again, don't, uh, our advice is probably not to be over optimistic about any, any extensions for, for deadlines because the contracting authorities are, well, reluctant to do so because the, probably the common example is that they're late, they are late themselves to announce the tender and everything is already urgent on their side. So therefore the, the motivation. Then again, if you have any, well, particular and, and concrete reasons, right? For example, the, con the tender con conditions say that you have to provide, I know, additional buckle, book, booklets or, or confirmations from the manufacturer, additional uh, certifications. And the term is, let's say, I know, several business days, right? So you can actually pose the first, at that point in time, when you notice a, a, a short term, use the system and ask for an extension. And then again, if you see that nothing comes back your way, uh, well, have some leverage and leave leave some time to place a claim. So at least uh, one business day is probably a sensible time time to, to challenge it, right? Because the an unreasonable submission date could be a, 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 a solid uh, ground for placing a claim. Then again, given that the actual reasons for the, the term being unreasonable and unreasonable are, are in place. So it's very difficult to challenge the term without having any, any actual, actual reasons for it. So take, take that into account. I would also like to build up on one point that Shilin has briefly mentioned already, so the procurement budget. So uh, when looking through the tender form, uh, you will see the, the tender announcement within the, the platform, the CPP platform itself, and the tender documents. So these could be Word or PDF files attached that you have downloaded or, 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 or viewed through your browser. So within those, you would either see the maximal, maximum addition, available budget the contracting authority has or, or, or you would not. Uh, in most cases, it should be announced on the platform, but in some cases, it, it could be also announced only within the procurement documents. So keep a, a, an eye on, on both of those. Uh, both of those documents, but the, the issue here is that if, if the maximum budget, the available budget that the con contracting authority has on, 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 on stock it is announced, this serves as the maximum value for your bid. If you would place anything above that, it almost always will result in your proposal's rejection. So this means that if you fail to to note that the maximum budget is announced and you count your proposal value on your own, which ends up being higher, you basically just uh, yeah, wasted your, your proposal and, and your effort, right? So please take a look uh, and, and keep note of that. Uh, and just to wrap it up, if the procurement budget is not announced, this means that the contracting authority will decide it, uh, well, to bargain in a way, right? Because then none of the suppliers know what is the actual budget and everyone's guessing in a way, right? Estimating probably would be the more correct word because you still have the, the procurement object at hand. But in this case, even if, 
if the the, the contracting huh? the contracting authority uh, will still have the mass maximum budget that is secret to, to, to itself and unannounced. And in this case, if you would, uh, if your proposal would be more than the unannounced budget, this would this could not result in your proposal's rejection. Meaning that if you would still be announced the winner and the contracting authority would have grounds for it, it could it could accept your proposal as as exceeding the initial budget, but still acceptable. It's a small uh, quibble within the law, but it, it is an option, but do do keep note of, of the budget. Um, right, now I'm being mindful of the time. I still have just a few points to go. So I guess, yeah, I guess I will finish up before, before the break. Right, and the award criteria, normally, uh, well, not probably normally, but most often the award criteria will be pricing. But please note that, well, at least the Lithuanian law provides, well, a cap of annual tenders that can be evaluated only by price, which means that uh, not more than 70% of the annual tender value of a given contracting authorities. Uh, may be evaluated by price. So this is important for you if you're a supplier of goods, works, or services that are necessarily not the cheapest on the market, but are respected for their quality, right? So you would be more interested and, have, and would have more, more, uh, more interest in placing a bit that has a quality criteria to it. So if you would notice that within a given year, uh, a contracting authority does nothing but announces price-based tenders, do note that in a way it's, it's preaching the law and, and yeah, uh, measures can be taken, taken to that extent. Of course, you would need to consult uh, lawyers, but then again, it's, it's best first to approach the contracting authority and, and indicate that it, it is under the obligations to enact quality-based criteria uh, as well. And in this way, yeah, uh, both implement the law and, and get more, more uh, of qualitative good services and works. I think that is it for my part, which wraps up the second portion of our presentation. Do we have any questions or that we would like to address or should we uh, have time for the break? Uh, yes, there is one question. Okay, I see. Okay, I will read it out. Assume yes. the budget is announced in the procurement documents and all tender participants submitted their price offers which are above the announced budget. Is there any tolerance allowed? Let's say 10, 15, 20 percent above the budget, which would be, which would enable the contracting authority to go ahead and conclude the contract. Yeah. So if, as I've mentioned, is if the budget is announced, the contracting authority, yeah, basically has no other option but just to reject the, those proposals, which would be different. Uh, in the instance that the budget would be not announced, then it could have this tolerance level presupposed in, in let's say their initial tender procedural documents, right? And then, uh, then the contracting authority could go ahead and, and sign the contract with the, with the winner that still exceeds the budget, right? Because uh, basically this serves, uh, well, the purpose of probably plain logic, right? Because the tender conditions set the maximum threshold, whereas, uh, yeah, the tolerance level would be only an addition to the budget, right? Which means that for a contracting authority, if it knows that it has it could allow itself 
let's say 1 million plus 10 percent well that virtually means that it can allow itself 1 million 100,000 right so there's no point in actually adding the tolerance level uh, it just it, it's uh, it's an it's it's discretion to indicate the threshold uh, correctly and 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 accurately yeah so yeah, but, that would uh, be the question yeah but uh, just to add polus um, the public procurement office uh, tries uh, recommends to, to establish some uh, initiative uh, modern uh, meet uh, meet criteria so uh, the contracting authority may in tender documents announce that uh, if bidders provide a higher price than the procurement budget then uh, the bidding score is downgrading for that specific tender so uh, the procu public procurement office uh, recommends such a, a, a new method how to evaluate tenders in lithuania and is starting uh, to, to do so some some contracting authorities just say in procurement documents that this is our budget but if you are willing to uh, go ab above our budget so we will get you your proposal will, will get a minus a minus some kind of minus score and you will still com may compete with others but you will get a certain point a minus minus scoring points so it's um, a new approach in lithuania that is, is sometimes applied right right thank you which in turn actually well at least in my opinion means a different set of of evaluation right because even the example that you just explained right virtually means that the contracting authority may allow itself additional expenses it only prefers not to so yeah in practice it means that the money is still there looking from the perspective from the contracting authorities it just chooses an evaluation system how not to, not to have those yes, additional yes. expenses yeah right so yes so we can so we can have a break at least for 10 minutes. So it's 10 minutes before 12, we just uh, return to the last and I suppose uh, maybe the most practical and uh, yeah. useful presentations that is usually <laughs> interesting for companies. So we just meet in 10 minutes. So thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So if you, Gilvinas or Paulius, are ready to restart, so we can go on <laughs> with the last part. <laughs> oh, pa Paulius, can you share the screen? Can you see the slides? Yeah, we see, but there we go. Oh. Part three, right? But I, I can't control those slides. Yes, give me a moment. You should be able to do so now. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. So we, uh, let's proceed with the practical uh, tips and legal aspects. It's uh, our usual they work on these topics and we usually solve uh, those practical uh, issues and uh, sometimes it seems that uh, there should be no left uh, uh, uncertainties in public procurement so there are a lot of supreme court uh, explanations and so on but still there are a lot of uh, dismissals of procurement uh, proposals and there are a lot of disputes uh, it's, it's kind of strange uh, what kind of uh, different situations each time emerge. So we will try to, to talk on most relevant topics, which are uh, usually uh, 
raise some issues. The first one is about building team structure and responsibilities. So how to um, gather your team members uh, uh, to participate together and what are the responsibilities of each other. The second topic is about bid validity term and guarantees. So for how long the bid should be valid, uh, until, until when, and uh, what kind of guarantees the bidder should pre present to secure its uh, proposal and bid. The third topic is about bid clarifications after its submission. So when the bidder can clarify and what can the bidder clarify after its submission. There are a lot of re restrictions on this topic. The second subtopic was, will be about exclusion criteria and qualification requirements. So we just take uh, some most uh, uh, problematic issues and the most relevant for you. Uh, there is also a very hot topic about confidential data, new explanations from uh, European court as well. And uh, another topic will be about false deceitful data and liars list. So we, we have a, such a uh, responsibility if you're lying in public procurements. And the last one will be about essential infringement of a procurement contract and blacklisting the company. So if you fail to comply with the requirements, you may face some uh, responsibility. So starting from, uh, with the bidding structure and responsibility. The, the tenderer may participate and place a bid alone. So no, nothing special. Uh, the bidder plays alone. It, it, it is responsible alone for the contract as execution and takes full responsibility for any fa fa failure to, to do uh, in the required manner. Uh, but uh, that entity may cooperate and uh, submit a bid together with joint venture consortium partners. And um, in that case, a certain uh, joint venture agreement or consortium agreement should be made between those companies. And uh, those companies should agree what kind of works one ent entity will perform, what kind of uh, uh, works or uh, supplies or services will be conducted by other partners. partners. In, and they, and there they should agree on the accounting issues and other issues uh, of responsibilities. Uh, entity also the bidder may submit uh, uh, the proposal uh, itself, but uh, also take uh, within uh, its bid structure some subcontractors. So uh, it is a bit different. Uh, uh, cooperation agreement than the joint venture agreement. I will talk about uh, a bit later. And uh, it also means that uh, the bidder should uh, conclude some subcontracting agreements and to give some part of work, supplies, or uh, services to, to do for uh, a subcontractor. And the subcontractor has no direct relation with the uh, contracting authority itself. The subcontractor has relation only with the uh, bidder. Uh, where, where while uh, the joint venture consortium men, members are considered as one tenderer, uh, as one bidder, and there um, has a, a, a direct communication with the contracting authority as a, uh, as a bidder, as a consortium. Uh, the entity may, uh, the bidder may uh, cooperate with future employees. So, uh, for example, if procurement documents foresee some kind of uh, requirements to have uh, specialists with a certain professional experience in the field of construction, in the field of engineering, in the field of medical sector, and so on, and the, and the company bidder itself uh, does not have such a, a specialist, so the company may agree to employ uh, a, a a qualified specialist in case of winning the bid and uh, to provide to a contracting authority a letter of intent uh, between the bidder and the future employee that a uh, bidder will employ such specialist as employee in case of winning the bid. 
and this uh, cooperation is possible in Lithuania and uh, practically applied in our national tenders. So if you, if you don't have a specialist, a specialist, it does not mean that you need to apply to another company and seek for another company resource. You can directly search for individuals and uh, to employ them for exact contract, exact project execution. And you, uh, the employment will take place only uh, after the contract uh, is signed, but not the, uh, during the procurement procedure itself. The bidder also may uh, invoke uh, on entities only for qualification. Uh, it, sometimes it is not necessary uh, that the same entity who gives qualification, for example, professional experience, reference projects, uh, financial uh, stability, and so on, uh, sometimes it does not require that such uh, company will be a subcontractor, that, uh, that such company will also need to execute some kind of part of work, services, or goods. So uh, sometimes you, you may just uh, apply to a company who has qualification requirement and ask to share such kind of qualification to you to your company and do not give any any work or, or, or anything any any tasks for such uh, entity so but it depends on each procurement and each the structuring of procurement documents but this option is allowed and this it's different than subcontracting as such and also entity may invoke other resources which we are not previously mentioned so some kind of um, shops who provide some necessary uh, goods to, for works to be carried out for a contracting authority, some um, uh, premises uh, le uh, leaser uh, who provides the premises to, for conducting a seminar to, uh, to contracting the authority and so on. So uh, the legal acts does not limit any form of participating with others. And it's up to the procurement documents uh, uh, how you may structure the, the bid. But those options are available in, in national procurement. The, the most secure option in any tender is uh, to disclose each subject at the day of bid submission and to provide evidence that you, your company uh, will uh, has uh, has the availability to rely on such resource. So you need just to, when you're placing a bid, you should name in the bid that you will invoke some subcontractor XXX, uh, you will employ some employees, blah, blah, blah. And also you should not, not, not uh, name it, but also provide evidence that this resource is legally available to you. So it could be any document. In our practice, it is used the letter of intents where the bidder and the uh, subcontractor, future employee, uh, other entity, just to, to share general uh, obligation to, to participate together in, a, in an agreed manner and uh, such letter of in, at intent with no specific conditions uh, of participation could be enough sufficient evidence to prove that you may rely on such entity. Um, so also you, if you're participating with a joint venture members, you, so you should pre present joint venture agreement uh, or preliminary agreement to, to employ a future employee. So it's a, uh, it's not limited the way how to, you can prove your, your reliance on the team members. And the biggest difference is in responsibilities. If you participate together with the joint venture partners, it means that each joint venture partner is jointly or severally liable in case of any fail, fail, failure for the contracting authority. So uh, if one of the consortium members fails to act uh, as required per contract, contracting authority may claim losses or other requirements uh, to any of the uh, joint venture partners to, or to all of them. And it means uh, it's quite risky to participate with the joint venture members who 
you do not rely much. And if someone will pay lawyer to meet the requirements, so the others will still be liable to fully execute the contract. And if some losses will emerge, so you will take responsibility for all uh, uh, those losses. After awards, uh, the joint venture members may uh, uh, pose the, those requirements to each member separately, consortium member, but it's a subsequent action and it's quite risky also. It is depending on the agreement of contract, um, joint venture agreement and so on. And in our practice, uh, there are quite, I guess, much uh, examples when the uh, joint venture members pay, pay, fail, uh, fails to comply with its part of works, uh, the other uh, uh, partners uh, uh, don't want to take the joint liability. Uh, and uh, it means that the contracting authority terminates the whole procurement contract with the remaining uh, um, consortium partners and seeks for damages, com compensation of damages. And uh, it's uh, very risky not to accept this joint liability. Uh, as regards other uh, reliance options, when you rely on subcontractors, uh, future employees or other reliance uh, options, it means that the bidder itself uh, is liable and responsible uh, in front of contracting authority for its own actions and for all other uh, reliance resources. Those other resources are not uh, uh, jointly liable uh, directly to a contracting authority. Contracting authority will claim all losses or any other requirements directly to the bidder itself for the bidder and all other resources failure us to act uh, as required. There are some exemptions. For example, if uh, the subcontractor uh, gives uh, uh, some qualification related to financial data, so uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the procurement documents, such uh, subcontractors are also jointly liable in front of contracting authority. It means uh, if someone gives uh, financial uh, data to meet qual uh, financial qualification requirements, in some cases, such uh, entities will be also jointly uh, liable together with a bidder in front of contracting authority. So but it's in some rare, rare exem ex ex exemptions and uh, it should be listed uh, this in procurement documents, uh, this uh, situation in each, each procurement, uh, yeah, different procurement. Uh, and this, uh, this topic is, uh, uh, poses a lot of risks in our courts in a lot of uh, different uh, manners. Uh, some, uh, some tenderers, bidders, forget to disclose uh, its reliance at the day of bid submission. And uh, it is not allowed to indicate new, uh, new reliance uh, resources after the bid takes place. Uh, there are some ex exceptions, but uh, in as a general rule, you should disclose every, every, everything at the day of bid submission and if it's the most secure option. Uh, so it's... Um, very disputable topic in, in Lithuania. Bid validity term, so it, uh, the contracting authority requests uh, uh, the tenderer to provide its bid validity term and it's usually foreseen in public procurement documents. The, public procu the contracting authority may request that the bid will be valid for, for example, 90 calendar days after its submission. And it's quite a usual term of bid validity term. But it depends on each procurement document and need, you need to look at the procurement documents, what kind of bid validity term uh, the contracting authority requests. Uh, and uh, also the contracting authority may request that the bid 
uh, would be secured, guaranteed by a bank or insurer guarantee or other secured options, such as, for example, providing a deposit of, uh, of respective monetary value. Uh, see, uh, contracting authority may request, so it's a discretion for a contracting authority to request or not, but this discretion is applied only to simplified procurements and low value procurements. But when it comes to international procurements, uh, contracting authority must, it's uh, an obligation to request some kind of securement in case uh, the bid will be uh, waived or uh, you will not uh, agree to sign the agree agreement with a contracting authority. And uh, as a general rule, contracting authority cannot uh, reject the security which was issued by not, not a Lithuanian bank or not a Lithuanian insurer. And uh, if uh, those foreign entities meet the reliability criteria set out in procurement documents, so even Latvian banks or insurers should be acceptable by a contracting authority in Lithuania. Sometimes the contracting authorities for, foresee in their documents what kind of criteria uh, reliability criteria should be met by banks or insurers. Sometimes it's uh, linked to the uh, ratings of international subjects such as pitch ratings, uh, SNP and Moody's. And so if, if the low Latvian bank or insurer meets such uh, ratings, so it means that such uh, insurance document or guarantee is acceptable in the Lithuanian procu procurement. And uh, uh, it, it is usually allowed in public procurements even before the bid submission takes place to ask uh, contracting authority whether uh, the certain bank or certain uh, insurer will be acceptable by contracting authority and the contracting authority should uh, indicate before submission whether it is accept acceptable or not such a subject. So uh, if the, uh, the bidder will waive its, uh, refuse uh, its uh, bid or refuses to sign a contract uh, with, with a contracting authority, so contracting authority may apply directly to the insurer or bank, or bank and request to the sum which was indicated in the bank guarantee or insurer document uh, as, uh, as a minimum losses of contracting authority. Uh, even the contracting authority did not request it in procurement documents uh, some kind of me secure securement measure. Uh, the contracting authority may still uh, request for losses if a tenderer uh, will refuse to sign a contract or will uh, waive its uh, bid before signing with a contract. And uh, follow, uh, following our court practice, Supreme Court practice, the contracting authority may request the difference, the price difference between the first place and the second place. If the, the, the first place refuses to sign the contract and the contracting authority signs uh, the, the same contract with the second place, it means that there is a risk for the first tenderer who refused to sign the contract uh, to compensate losses of uh, price difference between the first one and the second one. Mm, there are uh, Supreme Court practices where such requirements um, were uh, satisfied uh, and the tenderers needed to compensate uh, certain am amounts. And uh, following our Supreme Court practice, the, uh, the refusal to sign uh, the contract is not an illegal action itself. Uh, the the legal actions is uh, the ho honesty of a tenderer itself, whether uh, the reasons why the tenderer uh, refused to sign the contract, were, whether it was obje uh, objective and uh, reasonable or not. So if you reject, uh, uh, refuse your proposal or if you refuse to sign the contract, uh, uh, it still will be evaluated whether those reasons why you did so are reasonable uh, and uh, transparent, objective, and so on. And if, if the court will find out that these reasons were not so 
reasonable, uh, were not so objective and were not necessary. So there is the risk to, for, of price difference losses uh, highly exists. Mm, yes, about the bid clarification after submission. So when you place a, a bid, the contracting authority evaluates the bid and may ask you questions if something is uncertain for contracting authority. But uh, in our uh, court practice, uh, this, uh, this is very limited. Uh, the tender has very limited possibilities to explain and uh, clarify its bid after its submission. When we are talking about bid pricing, technical data about the suggested procurement object or data which is related to award criteria. So uh, the tender is, allow is allowed it only to clarify not essential data, which could not be qualified as new one and only sim simply explanations or grammatical corrections are needed. So it's very minor cases when the, um, Tender may clarify its bid regarding bid price, technical data about procurement object or uh, data related to award criteria. For example, you uh, the, the contracting authority buys a car and requires that such car will should be uh, with a specific technical feature. And uh, the bidder uh, fails to provide some kind of brochures uh, proving that this car has such uh, technical features as required per technical specification. And if during clarification uh, stage, the bidder will provide such brochures, new data about the car, about the car features, which were not in the previous bid. So it could be, and it uh, likely will be considered as a material change of a bid. And it is a ground uh, to dismiss the proposal. And uh, this topic is very um, problematic and uh, there's a lot of case, cases in our um, Lithuanian courts. E each competitor tries to, uh, to prove that uh, another competitor essentially um, uh, made essential changes to the proposal and that there is a ground to dismiss proposal and so on. When we are talking about qualification requirements, there is some space for clarifications, but still there are a lot of restrictions to do so. The qualification data could be clarified only once. So it's followed by our new Supreme Court practice from previous year. So if contracting authority asks to clarify the data about your professional experience, reference projects about specialists and so on. So you should uh, take into consideration that it could be, uh, could be one uh, request and there could be no other requests and you should take uh, uh, a lot of efforts to provide everything that, uh, that the contracting authority will not raise any additional questions. And in addition, uh, the bidder may clarify only the data which was previously uh, uh, submitted with the initial bid. For example, if you uh, submitted five reference projects about previous experience in uh, construction objects, so you can just clarify those five objects which you initially uh, submitted, but not to add additional, uh, for example, additional projects and, and say that, look, my company has uh, seven other uh, construction objects which were also previously executed. So it, it will be also not in line with the current Supreme Court uh, practice. It, will, it could be that the contracting authority will not accept uh, such kind of uh, clarification. And uh, there, there is only one really, uh, one relief for a bidder. Uh, for example, if contracting the authority uh, establishes that some, some subcontractors are not in line, with, in line with the qualification requirements, then the contracting authorities should and must, must allow the tenderer to replace the subcontractor with another meeting the qualification requirements. 
and this could be done only once. Uh, so if you if you invoke a subcontractor which does not meet the qualification requirements, you may um, amend your proposal after during cl clarification stage and say that look, I have a new one which meets uh, ev ev every requirement. Polis, maybe you. Yeah, you. that is me. Only I see that there's one question. Allow me to take back the control. And the question is I will read it out again. What is the practice of the so called blacklist in public procurement? Oh, very good question, Andres. Uh, can I put a pin in it? Because we have uh, several short slides relating to it. So thank you for the question, but we will, uh, we will get back to it uh, after our brief explanation and we'll see whether answered the question or if not, we, we uh, will do so afterwards. So, right, um, an important part uh, of the tendering documentation is, of course, the exclusion, exclusion criteria and qualification requirements, which, uh, well, of course, are not the same because you must not have any exclusion criteria, whereas you must satisfy all the qualification requirements, right? So you see the negative and, and, and positive difference there. Um, uh, let's kick off starting from the exclusion criteria. So just, uh, just to note that um, for low uh, value procurements, um, those are not necessary. And, uh, and, and uh, the contracting authority can uh, decide on its own whether to apply any or not but there's no, no legal requirement to do so. Um, whereas when it comes to simplified and national value procurements, um, well, the slide here says that some of them are optional and some of them are, are uh, obligatory. Uh, and a list is provided, a finite list that comes from the directive uh, that is transposed into Lithuanian uh, legislation within Article 46 of the National Procurement uh, Act of Lithuania. We will not go into details, but uh, the general rule that you should be following is that you should always check the procurement documents, what uh, exclusion grounds are applicable, because as I mentioned, some of them are optional. Some of them are optional regarding uh, the procurement value. Some of them are optional uh, measured between, let's say, contracting authorities of, of, of classical sector or the communal sector. So it's, it would be burdensome to have like a finite list uh, of all the possible exemptions. So just take a look at, at and mind the tendering conditions. Um, again, the same, the same applies for qualification requirements in a way, right? That we have no, no finite list when it comes uh, to the qualification requirements, yet the public procurement office has established a methodology which establishes categories of qualification requirements um, that should be followed. It, it also, the, number, the methodology also includes a uh, clause saying that other uh, qualification requirements in some cases may be applied, but the general rules is that, that contracting authorities abide by the exemplary list within the methodology and, and use those because, well, from their perspective, of course, it's much easier in case of a dispute uh, to prove that you are qualified, the qualification requirement that you as a contracting authority have enacted is proportionate, needed, if it directly uh, relates and resonates with, with, the, with the methodology. So there's the link if you can follow follow it up. Of course, it's in Lithuanian, but normally Google Translate gives you the ballpark uh, figure. 
And uh, yeah, in each tender, the contracting authority decides what requirements, qualification requirements are necessary, necessary what are proportional and, and, and allow for, uh, for just uh, competition, so to speak. So this is, of course, a, a theoretical general rule, which uh, in practice, if, if, if you as a supplier do not meet the qualification requirements, of course, the initial impulse is that it is unproportional and, and, and here uh, the tension arises, which, which can be solved by a claim basically. Right, going uh, swiftly, uh, analyzing together the exclusion criteria and qualification requirements. Uh, so the general rule also is that um, when placing a bid, you normally only declare that you have no exclusion grounds, which means that you should not, together with your proposal documents, uh, you should not gather all the certificates and, and, and documents uh stating for example that you have no prior conviction whether you yourself i don't know as a ceo or the company itself and uh so there's no need as a general rule for that please consult the the tender documents again and if in that if in doubt pose a question to the contracting authority but uh it's safe to say that this is the general rule so do keep in mind the exclusion criteria and see whether you will meet them if you would be the winner. But together with the proposal, only the um, European single procurement document is needed to declare it. Um, the tender conditions, uh, as I mentioned, define the exclusion criteria applicable for a particular tender and uh, normally, it lists out the documents that need to be submitted in order to prove absence of any exclusion ground. Um, here, we should take into account that, well, the contracting authority, of course, probably it, it does multiple tenders and knows the documents to be submitted, but it's also very useful to consult an official, official source which is the platform eCertis by the European Commission. Uh, you see the link uh, within the slide. Here you can see uh, a drop down, country by country, evidence by evidence, exclusion criteria by criteria, which documents, certificates, attestations and the like are available in each member state to prove one or, or the other ground, uh, well, as absence, right? So if you see that uh, this does not correlate well with the documents to be submitted that are indicated in the tender documents, uh, you of course might uh, politely approach the contracting authority and indicate this very fact and, and, and gather the documents that are within the e uh platform. Um, and again, just to, yeah, to, to reiterate, uh, before placing the ESPD, evaluate your, yourself whether you will uh, have, whether at the moment, at the date of posing the proposal, you have no grounds for exclusion and you will not have none in the future. And uh, only then move forwards and, and, and uh, place the proposal. Otherwise, yeah, if you would decide to, to with, withhold certain information or, or enact in creative interpretations, this could be uh, considered as fault, deceitful information. We will talk a bit about it a few slides later, which might have negative consequences to you. Qualification requirements, sort of the flip side of, uh, of exclusion grounds. Again, also most in most cases uh, only declared with the ESPD document together with the proposal. So again, filter them out, see whether you match all of them. Uh, think about which requirements you need to uh, employ subcontractors or uh, any other third parties for and indicate that. But uh, apart from that, no documentation is, is, is needed. 
just to reiterate what Gilman has already explained, you, you may satisfy them on your own, alone, together with employed subcontractors or a joint venture. So uh, the law provides uh, the contracting authorities not to limit any forms of partnership. So it's up to you to decide whether you want to go ahead and individually form partnerships or, or any other means. Uh, to some extent, qualification requirements are also covered in the eCertis platform, but I say to some extent because well, the, the, the standard requirements differ quite a bit country by country. So, and they're pretty lively. Even the Lithuanian methodology was uh, re-updated just uh, last year. So it's really difficult for the platform to, to, to keep up the to speed. Therefore, it has only limited applicability in this case. Um, and the same goes for, for any false deceitful information. So just uh, know, note that you should be well, relatively firm uh, in your own account, whether you meet the, the requirements or, or no. So any, any quibbles or, or flexible interpretations might, might cause damage. And we'll speak about it a bit later. Um, as I said, uh, lying is not allowed, but then again, when it comes to qualification requirements, uh, virtually any kind of evidence regardless whether it's foreseen in the tender documents or not is available. So for example, if you would need to prove that you have provided a certain amount of goods or, or a certain or certain goods for a certain amount in euros, you could uh, the contracting authority might require you to, to submit a contract that has been completed, but you might also make use of, um, delivery deeds, let's say, uh, written confirmations from the past client, right? Any publicly available information. When it comes to constructions, you could refer to, well, publicly, publicly available data that, I don't know, a certain building has been properly built and reg registered according to the law. So think think creatively and sort of outside the box, but without, without crossing the line of, of lying. Um, we also had uh, one question prior to the seminar that we looked into uh, regarding the specialists, right? Because there's so in some uh, work, public procurements for work, uh, well, probably even in most uh, qualification requirements for specialists are uh, required um, and local Lithuanian certification is uh, required. So here we would, we would like to draw your attention that uh, there are two probably thresholds that we have to take in mind. Together with the proposal, if you would be using a specialist that has a foreign Latvian certification, together with the proposal, you have to provide documentation that you have applied for recognition in Lithuania, which, does, which is not the same as an already recognized a certificate as, as, as valid and applicable in Lithuania, right? So that's the third point in time. The second point in time normally is the moment before signing the contract, which means that after you pose, po pose your proposal, some time lapses. And if you are the winner and you are invited to sign the contract, then before signing the contract, you could be required to provide proof that you have uh, a specialist that has his or her certification recognized in, in, in Lithuania. In some cases, if uh, there are certain instances where this point in time even is to some extent transposed into, well, past the contract entry into force, but then, then it really depends on what the actual qualification requirement is. Um, our brief experience, just just more of a feeling, is that well, for for a natural person certificate, Latvian certificate to be recognized in Lithuania, it takes about three four months. When it comes, if if we would be talking about a, a legal entity, right, and a, a legal person. 
uh, maybe two or three months. So do keep in mind that it's uh, it might take some time and you might, yeah, you might need some additional time between the proposal and, and contract entry force, right? But then again, you don't have to have all the certificates ready when posing the proposal, which is sensible because if you would not win the tender, then the question of, of recognition would not materialize, right? Uh, yeah, for for the legal uh, legal uh, persons as well, we have already covered it. So in this case, yeah, some local partnerships, subcontractors might be might be useful, or maybe an additional option is well hiring or agreeing to hire Lithuanian specialists that have the needed recognition to be employed within your, your company, the bidding entity, which sort of, uh, you know, is, 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 is a quicker way and does not have the recognition uh, step and the risks and all. Right, uh, with, when you evaluate yourself uh, and think about any partnerships, do mind that, uh, well, during, uh, the year before the last, we had uh, quite well, rather new and uh, and and strict legal case law that says that if if a particular tender can require can be compliant with the full set of qualification requirements on its own, then it should not. I'm pre paraphrasing, of course, but it should not go into joint ventures because that signals some form of unlawful artificial limitation on competition. So if you see that you would be normally compliant with the whole list of qualification requirements, but still would want to enter into joint venture, I would suggest seek legal advice. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I'm now mindful of the time. We still have a few slides left. I invite you to stay with us. Anita, is that okay if we go a bit about time uh i suppose that yes if it's uh yes if you should uh yes maybe 10, ten minutes yes because uh, let's say also uh we 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 uh, already indicated that uh, the that the webinar can last till one o'clock okay so perfect. it's okay so okay perfect so good then moving forwards uh, another important aspect which uh, might have, well, a, a, a relatively new twist when it comes to public procurement, uh, it relates to confidential da data. So do keep in mind and be prepared that in case you are su a successful uh, in a tender, right, that you are announced the, the, the winner, the, the winner of a given tender, other bidders, the within the proposal uh, list might and normally will acquaint themselves with your proposal. Now, this means that uh, we will cover what, what can and cannot be considered confidential data, but just, just be prepared that not everything is, is confidential because it's not a, not a private matter, right? It's public procurement. Now, um, some aspects and points that need to be taken into account. In all cases, the supplier that wants to protect certain parts or portions of its proposal has to be well proactive. Uh, normally, contracting authorities have a separate uh, a spreadsheet or, or a word page where the suppliers are requested to indicate what portions of the proposal is confidential and, and, and which are not. But then again, if you see no such form, do act diligently and add, add your own uh, comments or disclaimers, even well within the documents themselves or, or at least within the titles. Um, it's important that uh, normally contracting authorities uh, before deciding whether a particular information is confidential or not should 
should uh, in should approach you but then again it's not uh, obligated to follow your interpretation which means that well it 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 is a question for its own discretion. Yet in practice, we see that the yeah, contracting authorities tend to not disclose the information because just from the risk management perspective, it's easier for them, or well, maybe not easier, but more sensible to, to not disclose it and then have the court order to disclose it, to disclose it rather than to disclose it and suffer any possible claims regarding well, an unlawful uh, publication of some, some, such information, right? Um, uh, the exemption rule normally in Lithuania is interpreted that only commercial secrets are protected, but it differs and, and depends on the exact documentations. So what are the criterions that uh, must be complied with for a particular piece of information to be commercial, commercial secret, which would be protected as confidential data. So first and foremost, the data has to be secret. So for example, if you uh, try to, to, to render a particular contract, which is already announced publicly, let's say it's a public procurement contract with another contracting authority in the past, right? Of course, it, it will not be a commercial secret because it's already available online. Uh, the nature of the secret has its monetary and actual value. So normally the newer, um, I don't know, the in, in invention or, or the, trade, the, trade secret, the, the trade secret is, the newer it is within the market, the more protected it is. And if a certain, I don't know, manufacturer, manufacturing type becomes a standard practice, within a certain market, it's hard to render it uh, commercial secret, right? But then again, it's an evaluatory criteria and, and things need to be taken, taken into account within a given tender. And the third criterion is that the bidder has taken active measures to to keep it a secret, right? So if you have a certain, I don't know, client that you deem to be confidential data, but you are also announce it on your website as your most beneficial client, partner, or, or anything alike, that means that probably yeah, this bidder has not taken active measures to keep it a secret, right? So anything that goes against it and then, then does not conform with the third requirement. Um, as a point, as a general rule, a rule of thumb, it's, uh, it needs to be said that prices and price rates are never confidential. So the price or prices, if it's a fixed price contract and price rates, if it's a price rate contract, uh, but the the comprising parts, the bits that comprise the the price or the price rate, may be confidential. But then again, it differs and needs to be evaluated in in each case. Uh, we have provided you with an example that is well normally used by the public procurement office here in Lithuania. So, for example, this is the table that you would need to fill in. When it comes to, let's say, works, it could work with services or goods as well. So you would see that uh, normally uh, you have several sorts of direct expenses, right? So the in total sheet may not be confidential because this actually is the column, the quote that will, well, that decides that you are the winner, right? And it has to be made public because uh, this is actually the number that amounts to the contract value and to your proposal value that renders your proposal best. Whereas these sub subsections, sub columns, if we may call them that way, may be confidential. If we can, 
objectively ground that these are well only intrinsic parts of the total total uh, rate let's say and uh, meet up with the three requirements that we spoke about right and and create actual value and our commercial secrets of of you as a company right So that is that. Wait, I can't move my slides anymore. There we go, moving forward. Um, do keep in mind that it works both ways. So you, if you were runner up, you should, should be acting actively and, and pinpoint your interest in getting acquainted with the with the winners bit because it's in, in your interest maybe the winning uh, tender is not compliant with some requirements of the tender so yeah especially if you're the second the runner up the interest is great there if your proposal is is well third or 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 below then maybe the challenges are a bit slimmer to challenge it, but you still have the full right to get acquainted with the proposal. So even if you decide not to challenge the, the proposal, so to speak, it might still be well beneficial for you to see what, what your competitors are working on uh, proposal-wise. A uh, standard uh, means of operation should be adjusted, right? So uh, a sentence or two could be prepared as a standard message. So anytime you receive uh, a notice that the winner was announced and you're not it, you can straight away without even you know, thinking too much, send the message through the portal and, and, and wait for it because yeah, the contracting authority still has to, still has several days to gather the information and that that is an issue that could be important if you decide to claim it afterwards. Right, and the lists. So Lithuanians like lists, and we have two actually lists, the liars list and the list of un unreliable tenders, the, the, the blacklisting as our questioner posed. So first, let's go briefly through the, through the liars list. So the law provides for it. Uh, if and and it is comprised of bidders that provided false or deceit, deceitful information in past procurements. So if you do so within a given procurement, that contracting authority takes actions to add you to the list and certain risks apply. And these will be uh, the following. First, the false or deceitful information it, it, we chose the, the term dually because it's really hard to pin a, a, a point on it and choose one word, but it can relate to basically all aspects of your compliance with the tender documentation. So whether regarding the, the tender object itself, the qualification requirements, grounds for exclusions or anything alike, all, all of them can be the source, so to speak, of, of the deceitful information. So um, our case law enacted uh, uh, an, an additional rule that creative interpretation of some truth or, or concealing important parts of information also can be considered deceitful information. So it's still, well, the, the, the legal content of the creative interpretation, of course, is not finite. But one example could be if, you, if, if a company decides to use had a contract that was implemented together with its subcontractor, let's say, and it's virtually clear what were the responsibilities of the company and the subcontractor. But when posing a proposal, it decides to interpret in a way that the tasks completed by the subcontractor were its own. So, in a way, you would not be strictly lying that the, the company implemented the contract, but then again, you're creating creative interpretations regarding which, whether the company or the subcontractor implemented the, entire, the entirety of the contract. So this is 
a small quibble, but uh, but then then again, it's a good good example. And concealing information, of course, right? If you have a, a ground for exclusion applicable, but you decide not to disclose it, it, it could be could be a problem afterwards. Um, normally, signaling takes place because. Uh, when evaluating the, the declared and well revealed truths, the contracting authority still has to know what would be the supplier's interpretation of any informational inaccuracies, right? So if you would see that the contracting authority already approaches you with, well, with requirements for rather specific declarations or explanations. And you can sense that they have uh, second thoughts. It's best to, 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 yeah, to approach uh, legal specialists because as I said, the, the content of, of interpretation, deceitful, false information is still evolving here and it's best to not to make a, 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 a big mistake. Right, of course, if the contracting authority decides you to the, concludes that a company has provided deceitful information, you may still uh, dispute it in court. Uh, if unsuccessful, there's a public list on the website of public procurement office of all the companies that are considered to have to, to be liars, for lack of a better word, which in turn means that for one year, uh, the proposals of such company might be rejected in public procurements. But again, we have several exceptions. Two of the most important are that, uh, well, a contracting authority might not choose to, to apply the ground for excluding liars and low value tenders, right? And, and the second one is that the law provides for something that we call cleansing procedures. So active measures uh, proving that the company that was considered to have provided false information has, has agreed with them is doing, uh, enacted measures to, 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 to render any losses be covered and any corporate measures it's a list uh, that is rather finite but it's doable it's still doable and it, it, in practice uh, such companies might still take place in public procurement right and the very last topic answering our questioners point as well so as with the liars the law provides such a list and here the companies uh, end up if they have reached uh, well, essential material contractual ob obligations, what we call an es essential infringement. Now, the content of the essential infringement itself um, most concre concretely is described within the contract itself. That is the standard practice here in Lithuania that the contract does uh, indicate um, what is considered an essential material breach. Uh, if there's no such def the definition, of course, civil code can be applied, but uh, well, in practice, it's, it's a bit more difficult probably for the contracting authority, it could be said, but not undoable, right? Because then you would have to prove uh, whether a certain situation matches the, the criterions and, and circumstances described um, within the case law, what is and is not a material breach. Um, before uh, noting uh, of a termination regarding an essential infringement, yeah, it is also quite common that the contracting authority will send you warnings saying that, let's say, for example, if you do not deliver the goods by day X, we will consider this uh, material breach. So at that point in time, it's also a sensible idea to seek legal advice and, and see whether anything can be done, any extensions, any, any additional communication can be forwarded to the contracting authority. So that is also a smart idea. And um, 
as with the liars list, you may uh, dispute the decision to terminate the contract uh, due to essential infringement in court. Uh, interim measures, and actually this is the case law formed by our attorney office, uh, is that once the court proceedings are still ongoing, this company is still not regarded lawfully as an un unreliable supplier. So the court proceedings for, for the time being halt the decision of enactment to the list. But then again, if the uh, legal procedures would be unsuccessful, the company is added to the list, which is also on the website. You can see it there. And in this case, uh, yeah, the rejection might face uh, and extend up to three years. Again, same exemption supply. So if contracting authority decides not, not to apply this bound for a low value tender, this is not an issue. And the cleansing, the cleansing procedures as well. Yes, this is all from our formal side. And now I'm looking at the questions and answers and maybe I will, yeah, still read, read them out in the subsequent order. So the first question was, what is the practice of the so-called blacklist and public procurements in LT? What are the criteria being put on the list? The reasons for which tender participants could be placed on such a list? What are consequences, limitations to participate in future tenders fines for those who were put on such a list? How long the companies stay on the list? What do what to do in order to be removed from the list and things that could that it was put there by mistake or without a valid reason. So I think most of those issues were covered. I think we didn't talk about fines. So fines or any sanctions, if foreseen within the contract, apply as per civil law uh, measures, right? Uh, any claims of losses also go well, according to civil procedure and have to be claimed. If, if, if the contracting authority decides not, not, not to do so and well, thinks what to do when the company thinks that it was put by mistake or without a valid reason, dispute this in court. This, well, first and foremost, as, as I noted before, before you get the initial signals that this might happen also, this is the time to act. But if that, if anything that was done within that period does not work, you know, you, you have to challenge it in, in court and 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 try to render the decision of the contracting authority as unlawful. Moving forward, uh, what if a company from the liars list is used as a subcontractor for qualification in the tender participant? Is there a risk that such a bid could be disqualified? The tender may not really know whether the subcontract on those qualification it is relying in some aspects is or not on the blacklist. Right, oh, very good Apollo, question. Yeah, okay. I, I, will, I will may answer to this question because okay. it's, uh, it's already the Supreme Court uh, this year explained this answer and it said that the tenderer, the bidder should be allowed to sub substitute this subcontractor with another one. It's a June 3 decision of this year. And it says that if the tenderer itself did not knew about a lying subcontractor and invoked it for qualification, so the contracting authority should a right to substitute such liar with another one complying with the qualification requirements. So our national procure procurements also should follow this Supreme Court uh, explanation. Right, right. And the question is very good on, on doubly because it strikes a difference between subcontractors that are used for a qualification and that are not used for a qualification. So if you employ a subcontractor that is not used for a qualification, the question should not really arise whether that subcontractor is on any on any of the two lists. Right. If you uh, use the capabilities of a subcontractor for qualification, then all exclusion grounds uh, 
uh, trigger, meaning both be both lists. But as Gilman has pointed out, you should be required to substitute such a supplier. If if you would not be, then you would have to challenge. And our our position is that you would be in the right, and you would should win the right to substitute such a such a such a supplier or such as or the subcontractor that has issues with the lists could could try and prove whether they have uh, completed all the cleansing procedures so a few options there right so we still have i don't know a few minutes if anyone has any follow-up questions other than that, I think we are done from our side. Yes, thank you, Gilvinas and Paulius. It's, it, I suppose that uh, the information provided was really quite substantial. And also you provided uh, the websites and, 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 and also the system, how it works. And I suppose that really the, the companies that <laughs> uh, are interested and would like to, 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 to start and then and, and, uh, to work in Lithuania and participate in these standards, I suppose your information provided a very good start. So thank you. Thank you. And, and here are, all, are also your contacts and then probably you would get uh, even more questions afterwards this seminar. Yeah, so please contact us. I'm pretty sure you have received or will receive the slides. So do not hesitate to contact us. We're more, more than happy to help. Yeah, mm -hmm. labi, paldies visiem, kas piedalījās šajā webinārā. Un droši jūs varat šos jautājumus gan lektoriem, gan arī caur mums šos informāciju nosūtīt. Un tad noteikti ceru, ka šī informācija jūs pamudinās arī piedalīties un veiksmīgi piedalīties webināros. Tā kā paldies un, un, un tiksimies nākošreiz kādos citos semināros par citām valstīm. Paldies, Gulbu. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> jā, Bye. visu labu, jā. Bye. Bye.